I don't have any issues with everything that is posted about me online because I'm okay with my clients seeing it. And if they see something about me that tells them I don't want to work with this person, that's okay. There are lots of lawyers out there. There is somebody else who is a good fit. I would rather have them figure that out before they ever pick up a phone or send me an email. They can just bypass that whole issue and go, I need to go somewhere else. They will self-select out so that neither of us is potentially wasting our time looking at a relationship that is never going to work. Does your online presence effectively represent who you actually are? Can you effectively separate your business and professional personas? Should they be the same? What are the rules and guidelines for playing online, especially on Twitter? Our guest this week is attorney Ruth Carter of Carter Law and GeekLawFirm.com. Ruth's practice covers IP, social media, and internet law, and they have a great set of best practices to help you avoid the pitfalls that are so easy to slip into online. We'll talk about Ruth's unique terms of service for receiving cold email requests, as well as the simple ways you can protect your personal and professional brands while still maintaining your natural personality and humor. Regardless of how often you put yourself out there online, there are great tips and steps to keep in mind as you keep yourself safe and sane online. Let's get into it. I'm John Strohmeyer, and this is the Five Star Counsel Podcast. The market for legal services is shifting, and lawyers who don't adapt will be left behind. This podcast gives you a competitive edge in today's market by sharing the client service lessons you probably didn't learn in law school or in law practice. Let's start the show. Hey, Five Star listeners. Before we start, I want to tell you about our amazing sponsor, Smith AI. Smith AI is a virtual receptionist service for small businesses with a specialty in working with solo and small law firms. I signed up with them within weeks of starting my firm because they are affordable for even the smallest solo practice. Their friendly receptionists respond to potential clients in Spanish or English, screen and schedule new leads, and can even take payments. And now they're answering calls 24 hours a day. So even when you're asleep, they're still working. Even beyond the phone, they've got live agents and chat bots ready to capture leads on your website by text and by Facebook Messenger. Smith's friendly gatekeepers can staff your front line so you can work uninterrupted. You can finally have the peace of mind that while you're working, you're not missing out on future work. Plans start at just $70 a month for calls and $100 a month for chats. Smith AI is offering a free trial, and our podcast listeners get an extra $100 discount code with promo code 5 star. That's F I V E S T A R. Sign up and learn more at www.smith.ai. Don't let another day go by. Try Smith AI. Oh, Ruth, you can't make me laugh before we start recording like this. <laughs> uh, Ruth Carter, thanks so much for joining me today. <laughs> Oh, thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, So, Ruth, I heard you chatting with Adriana Linares a few weeks ago, and I was like, this is great. I need to reach out to Ruth and get him on my show. When I was doing some background research on you, I noticed, and I thought this was hilarious, you have terms of service for emailing you on your website, and... I've got my shorthand for do for explaining how this works. I want you to just start with your uh, forced charitable giving program. So I'm sure many lawyers have this experience that you get unsolicited pitchy emails all the time for people who want to um, write a guest post for your blog or they want to offer you marketing services, voiceover, internet, phone services, whatever. I get these all the time and they were so annoying. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna put up a page on my website that addresses this so people know in advance my position. So I put it up and it says, if you send me a pitchy email, um, you are expressing your willingness to send $20 to the charity of my choice. So, Every time I get one of these pitchy emails, I have a pre-written response that says, per the terms of service on my website, 
this is the rule. Here's your here's the charity I've selected for you. Here's your link to make your donation. There you go. So, and how often do, uh, how, when you send that right out, how does that? What sort of responses do you get? Do they actually go through with the donation? Some people do, and I get the response back saying, "Well played. I didn't do my homework." You know, here's the, you know, they'll even sometimes send the receipt of, I, oh, wow. I did it. And some people will just go away, which is perfectly fine. Like my goal that's, was that's to a good answer too. make them stop. And then I get some that are kind of like, a, I, I suspect it maybe is a bot that is saying, you know, oh, we, we can't pay. You know, they, they assume that I said, if you pay me $20, you can have a post and they'll respond with, oh, we can't afford that. We want one for free. And then I respond back with, oh, no, you misunderstood. The $20 is just for annoying me. And I would have never allowed guest posts on my site. But since you've contacted me twice, you now owe the charity 40 bucks. <laughs> oh, this is great. I mean, it. it you kind of lur lurking in what you said. It's not just making them stop, but it's helping to filter out the wrong people and make it as easy as possible for them to, well, make them stop or at least make them go away. And that is the goal. And you're still doing it, which means it's probably working, or at least it's, it's giving you enough entertainment value and charitable contributions to be worth your while to do it this way. Exactly. If I'm going to have to deal with your email in my inbox, I'm going to make it worth my while. This is all a good way to kind of lead us into, well, when we start playing online, we may occasionally put content out there. Maybe it's an unsolicited email that has triggered an unforced charitable donation. But we may be landing ourselves in some hot water elsewise. So... Ruth, what can we do about it? What should we be thinking when we start playing online? So let me start by sharing my two rules of thumb. My first rule is don't post anything online that you wouldn't put on the front page of the newspaper. And then my second rule is assume everything you post is going to be seen by at least the following four people. Your best friend, your worst enemy, your boss, and your mother. If you don't want one of those people seeing what you're thinking about putting out there, don't do it. So that's my litmus test to see, do I really want to say this or am I just pissed off in the moment and I need to simmer down and stay, you know, step away from the internet. So that's what I tell people. That's what I use for myself. That's what I suggest to people. You, if you're going to put something out there, you need to be ready to own it in any situation for the rest of your life. I'm so glad my teenage years weren't documented on the internet like kids put their lives online now. Um, but on top of that, I see people running into issues with internet law all the time. That's one of the areas of law that I practice. And it's everything from intellectual property infringement to defamation. I even deal with some revenge porn situations. And there are situations where people are doing things that are perfectly legal, but still have ramifications on their life. Like if you are posting something pseudonymously or anonymously and you are unmasked or situations where you are an at will employee and you post something that is absolutely legal to post, but your employer didn't like it. And so when you go back to work, you're getting yourself in trouble or worse fired. Right. And the thing that jumps to my mind, hanging out in law Twitter land You'll see a lot of a lot of lawyers who are there have significant followings, you know, several thousand to tens of thousands of followers, and they're posting on clearly pseudonym under pseudon you know pseudonyms or noms to plume, whatever you want to call them, and they'll acknowledge this is this is who they are, or they're they're a lawyer, they've got some whatever relevant experience, but they probably understand that hopefully. You know, these are usually big firm lawyers. They're playing with fire in a lot of ways. 
Potentially, yes. I know of a legal blogger who no longer blogs. Um, they were an associate at a big firm and they would talk about the bizarre, hilarious, real things that you deal with when you're an associate practicing law, whether that's crazy clients or um, and crazy opposing counsel and his blog was hilarious but he knew and I think this is one of the reasons why he doesn't blog anymore is that there was always that risk that people were going to find out that he was the person behind the keyboard right and then it just it makes things a little more difficult so how, how do we balance the part of the way that we have our names out there one way or another or we release some bit of psychosis that if it stays trapped up in our heads will drive us crazy. You know, this is the release. Well, I mean, there's, there are lines to walk. What, where do we go? What do we even do with this? Okay, well, let's think about what did we do before we had the internet? You would tell your friends, you would tell your spouse, you would tell your dog, you would write it in your diary. Something to that effect where you can vent it off, uh, whether you're angry or it's just the story is so outrageous, you just have to share it. I understand. But maybe don't do it in a public forum where there's a permanent record. Um, you know, even if you like delete the tweet, it's still on a database somewhere if, if there's ever a court order to, to bring it back up again. So yeah, you really have to think about do you know again, would I put this on the front page of the newspaper? Do I want my boss to see this? Even if you're anonymous, there you know, worst case scenario, somebody could unmask you or if you're there's a lawsuit, there could be a court order for Twitter to release the information, they trace it back to you. So you just have to be ready, no matter what you put out there, no matter the forum, no matter the privacy settings, you need to be ready to own it. And if you're ready to own it in any situation for the rest of your life, you're probably good to go. Right. The, the thought that just because you know, I, for example, have a personal private, you know, private choice, just because I have put my personal Instagram behind the privacy filter and, you know, I only let certain people come in and see it, it doesn't mean that it's it can't be screenshotted and reposted somewhere else. My, you know, my wife is the same way and occasionally she'll put something, you know, photos of our dogs that I want to share as well and I know how to get around it and it's it's as easy as that. We can figure out ways around it so thinking that you have somehow made yourself private isn't going to be anything that really protects you oh no there is no expectation of privacy in anything you post online there's even been court rulings on that one right and so when we as you know firm owners business owners we you'd mentioned ip infringement defamation you know I'm hoping most of my listeners aren't really worried about revenge porn, but just thinking about those two things with the IP infringement probably is the first one is you know, when I think about what we do online in marketing, it can be real easy to stray into a copyright violation just by having, you know, potentially music on in the background. I know Twitch has updated some of their settings so that while you're live streaming, you can have music from Spotify playing without violating their terms of service, but when people come back for the, the video on demand of that stream, they've stripped out the infringing uh, the infringing content. So most of our lawyers aren't gonna be live streaming anything they're doing legally related on Twitch. But what are the sort of things that we need to be thinking about when we're, you know, before we unintentionally uh, trigger a, you know, DMCA or some other takedown notice? I think people need to be conscientious when they are outsourcing any part of their content, whether that is music you know, or photos or videos, to make sure that you are only pulling content that you have a license to use. So that's why I have agreements with several photographers that I can use any photo um, off of their Flickr accounts. And if I can't find something I need there, I look over in Creative Commons or I find 
a photo that I've taken myself. Yeah, and I mean, is it, I think about how many things we use as, how many GIFs I use. Mostly I'm relying on Giphy and Twitter to tell me that those GIFs are fine enough, but I'll admit I have not even begun to think about that because they're the ones who are serving up the content to me as available. Yeah, and that's when it gets a little tricky and if it's something where it is being sp- widely used, it's probably okay because whoever owns the IP hasn't complained yet. And if they pick you to be the one they go after, you can always raise the argument of, okay, there are literally 17,000 other infringers who used it before me. Why am I being singled out? Because it appears that you've granted an implied non-exclusive license for any of us to use this. Right, right. Um, that kind of turning to the other side, the other big thing that we need to think about and probably is a bigger risk for most of us, the defamation of, you know, going online inventing may, you know, for public figures, I think we're, we've got a pretty wide berth from what I remember of libel law from law school, but Ruth, uh, where can we, where can we get in trouble online that way? You got to look at your state law. Cause of course it's. That's where defamation laws are listed. But if you post anything online that is not true and you damage someone's reputation, there's a risk that they're going to come after you for defamation. As you said, with public figures, we have a little bit more leeway. It has to be a situation where you knew or you should have known you were lying. Um, But if it's a private person, it's the bar is much lower it's in some states any lie could be enough because there is an assumption that any lie will hurt the person's reputation pulling it back to where we started you know we want to be ourselves online there are ways to make it easy for others to recognize us and the frequent example i've put on this show is i've got my dogs listed as employees of my website, on my website. And part of the reason is it's a great filter for people because the people who are coming to my website are always going to go check, you know, the, the number one page on my website is the staff. And that's where everybody goes first or ends up if they're thinking about using us. They end up at the, do- they see the dogs at the bottom. And we get a lot of people who say they love seeing the dogs why they're dog people, they're, even if they're not dog people, it's just a good sign that we're not going to be stuffy attorneys. And for everybody who comes in and says that, I know we're getting rid of at least one person who wasn't going to like that, and they have self-selected and they've gone away. And that is wonderful. Yes, absolutely. And that was something I kept in mind a few years ago when the firm I worked for was redoing its website. And I came up with the template for everybody's bio. And part of it was it included like, you know, fun facts about each attorney where each person got to decide what they shared about themselves. And the purpose was to humanize them and there are people who have hired the attorneys at our firm and they will tell the person like, I'm hiring you because of what I saw in your profile. Like I, I knew that you were the attorney for me. I don't just need somebody who practices your area of law. I want you the person. Exactly. It, it, you know, a lot of what we do, if we're, as long as we're in the right practice area, look, it doesn't matter how much somebody likes me or my dogs. I'm not doing family, <laughs> family law. I'm not doing criminal defense. But if you've got a choice, and as a state planner, you do have a choice here in town, there are choices. We want to make it easy for the people to see they're going to get heard and listened to by somebody who understands what they're doing. And it's, you know, we want to make it easy to get the right people in. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is partly why we have websites, is to show people not just what we do, but who we are. 
because people hire people. Even if they are contacting you on behalf of their business, they're still hiring not just the firm, but the person. And if it's a mismatch, it's not going to be an enjoyable working relationship for either side. So I tell people to put as much consideration into their lawyer as you would your doctor, because you may be disclosing some very important personal information. So it has to be somebody that you have a rapport with. Right. And just making sure you know, when we send out uh, when we're sending out referrals to other professionals, it's you're interviewing them as much as they should be interviewing you. And same goes for us here. We want to make sure that we we like working with you because we're going to be spending some time together. It might as well be enjoyable for everybody involved. And the faster you can like us and know what you're you're getting into, the easier it's going to be for everybody. And if we need to send you somewhere else because we're just not a good fit, we need to know that up front. Absolutely. And that's why I don't have any issues with everything that is posted about me online because I'm okay with my clients seeing it. And if they see something about me that tells them I don't want to work with this person, that's okay. There are lots of lawyers out there. There is somebody else who is a good fit. I would rather have them figure that out before they ever pick up a phone or send me an email. They can just bypass that whole issue and go, I need to go somewhere else. They will self-select out so that neither of us is potentially wasting our time looking at a relationship that is never going to work. Yeah. And so, I mean, I heard one of the things that you did use when the, the template of, let's think about some fun facts. I know from looking at resumes, I'll see running, cooking, traveling as very generic, non-specific things. And that seems like pitfall number one, being so generic that it doesn't say anything. Right. What are some other ways, you, you know, having, having templated it, having templated this out for the prior firm, what were some other ways that people were not sharing enough of themselves? Well, I think there's two issues that came up with that up in there, because um, one of the other sections I talked about was not just what areas of law each person practiced, but what are they good at doing and how do we describe what they do and how they do their work. And that to a degree requires suspending any notion of modesty because other people tend to brag about you better than you will feel comfortable bragging about yourself. And so I ended up writing like half the staff's bios because they would write it and I would be like, okay, this is a good start, but you're way better than what you're putting down for yourself. So let me, you know, let's sit down for an hour. Let me talk to you about you know, why you like practicing law, what you like doing, what do you, you know, what do you think you're good at within your practice area? And I would build on that to create a bio that was much richer. Um, like, I think mine, I can't remember if it's in my real bio or in my blatantly honest bio, both are online, uh, where I talk about how I love writing and I can do everything from a very nicely phrased letter to you know the worst nastiest gram you can think of so and i think for some people that will either say like i like this or no this you know not a not a lawyer i want to work with which again right. is fine right again it, going through and having looked at what you had up there of like hire me to do these sort of things and again Putting it in client language, not lawyer language. Nobody, well, I barely know what a motion for summary judgment is, and that's okay. Uh, I don't need to. I don't litigate anything. I don't want to litigate anything. But thinking through and say, look, I enjoy managing your estate planning process, so it's not a mess when you die. If you're looking, you know, things I don't enjoy doing, getting in the mud and fighting with somebody else in long and protracted litigation. That is not worth my time in any sort of case. And just thinking about, all right, well, 
I probably need to revise my bio to add in the, you know, what you'd said of what I do and how I do it. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to put in something that makes you more human, yeah, don't just stick to the obvious. Um, you know, even if it is like I like running. Well, okay, what do you like about it? Is it you like that? You know, you can feel yourself moving under your own momentum. Do you like doing like certain charity five Ks? You know, are are you known for running races in a banana suit? Like I, you know, that's much more interesting than just I like running. Right. And one of the things that I used to have on my resume when I cared about having a resume was in the last five years, I have done, you know, list three or four things just to say like, and the point was, I have done this thing that is interesting enough that somebody else will recognize it, but not so niche down that nobody will recognize it. Right. Exactly. Great. So, I mean, Ruth, as we kind of close this down, when you think about it, what do you think the next steps for you part, you know, like you've obviously spent a lot of time on this. What would, what's the next thing you would reach for in making yourself kind of more easily recognizable to good fits and bad fits? So unfortunately during the pandemic, I fell off the wagon in terms of blogging. So one of my plans is to get back on that horse and recommit to putting out new content every week, which will allow me to provide information about new laws as well as respond to developments related to my areas of law. Like lately online, the big thing is NFTs. And I have friends who have a podcast where they talk about marketing topics and nfts is a common topic and every time they talk about it i'm sitting there thinking about all the legal ramifications and so basically my blog is writing myself itself in my head as long i just have to put my butt in the chair and my fingers on the keyboard excellent ruth uh for folks who are looking more about you where can they find you online probably the best place to look for me is geeklawfirm.com or you can put Ruth Carter attorney in the Google machine and I will pop right up. Excellent. Ruth, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. You can find more info on us and get your free white paper on client service at fivestarcouncil.com. You can get in touch with me at john at fivestarcouncil.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe wherever fine podcasts are found and leave us a review wherever you can.